Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to our IIEA webinar on censorship and free speech in the digital age. My name is Joyce O'Connor and I chair the digital group here at the IIEA. And it is my great pleasure to welcome our distinguished guest, Gillian York, author and activist, who's the director for international freedom of expression at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, who is based in Berlin. Gillian, you're very welcome. And we're delighted to have you join us today. And thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us. Uh, we appreciate it very much and we look forward uh, to your presentation. Uh, Gillian will speak to us for around 20, 25 minutes, and then I'll go to your audience for questions and answers using the Q&A um, function at the bottom of your screen. Um, I look forward to receiving your questions and would very much appreciate if you could give your name and affirmation when you send in your questions. We would encourage you to join the conversation on Twitter, and our handle on Twitter is at IIEA. As is usual, our presentation today and the Q&A is on the record. Today's presentation is very timely. The current debate around hate speech and indeed disinformation has been well documented in the media. And here in Ireland, the proposed hate speech bill is currently going through the legislative processes. And today, as it happens, the first report on the emerging disinformation landscape in Ireland uh, by the European Digital Media Observatory based in DCU is published. So you can see there's a lot of interest, Gillian, in what you're going to talk about. Gillian will outline how the internet transformed the ability of all citizens to contribute to public discourse, discourse, especially those living under authoritarian regimes. The internet, uh, of course, has also facilitated the spread of harmful uh, content such as disinformation and hate speech. And Gillian will take us on a journey from Silicon Valley to Tunisia, to Cairo, to Berlin, so as to trace the change from the early belief in maximizing free speech by the citizens and the big tech companies alike to the policies of surveillance and control exercised by the platform and most governments. The issue of free speech is a much nuanced issue. And as Gillian York sees it, the central conundrum of social media is how to address hate speech. Based on her extensive research for her book on Silicon Values, the future of free speech surveillance capitalism, as well as her direct experience working with global rights activists who have experience of the internet and social media, she will give us a really good perspective. The internet, as I said, is both a critical organizing tool for democracy and freedom, as well as some pe people see it as a threatful environment and some would indeed say a vile environment and she will give us her unique perspectives and discuss how companies, platforms, democratic governments, as well as authoritarian regimes are responding with increased censorship and moderation of the internet. Gillian's presentation highlights her insight into what is at stake when private companies make speech and censorship decisions that at times have for some been a matter of life or death. She will argue that more protection of citizens is needed against the harnessing of our personal data. One commentator indeed has said, and I'm sure you've heard this before, Gillian, that your insights make us all think twice about signing those terms and conditions um, at that when we use our sites. Gillian will also assess the negative consequences that can result and explain how citizens can respond. As I've said, Gillian is the director for international, for international freedom of expression at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, a fellow at the Center for Internet and Human Rights at the European University at Vidrina, and a visiting professor at the College of uh, Europe in Natalin in Warsaw. Her work examines state and corporate censorship and its impact on culture and human rights 
with a focus on historically marginalised communities. She also works on European policy and the impact of sanctions on the use of genetic technology. And currently, she's looking and working around three particular topics, social media and conflict, adult nudity, and the decentralization of social media. Gillian, we look forward to your presentation. And thank you again for being with us. Thank you so much. And thank you for that kind uh, introduction. It's really um, sort of a perfect lead in to what I'm about to, to speak about. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> I'll start just from the very beginning, as I think that that's a, a great place to start. Um, and I like to share just briefly how I got into this space um, and how how my views have been shaped over time while bringing in all of the history that we're about to speak about. Um, so about 15 years ago, I was living in Morocco and trying to begin a career as a writer uh, and got involved with some activism, some advocacy campaigns through a group called Global Voices. Uh, that's really how I first learned about the ways in which the internet that was censored. Um, I experienced briefly some internet censorship myself when I couldn't access the blogging platform that I was trying to use at the time, uh, and then discovered um, in Morocco that a wide variety of speech was being censored by the government, mostly touching on religion, criticism of the human rights record in the country, uh, and criticism of the royal family, as well as a handful of other things. So that was really my entree into this. Um, and that led me to the work that I ended up doing at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard, uh, where I was hired to work on a project called the Open Net Initiative. It doesn't exist anymore, but the website is still out there, as are the three books that the project put out over the years. Uh, and the goal of that project was to create a survey of more than 65 countries and how they were controlling the internet. So it started first with what they called filtering or what we more commonly know as censorship, um, and also eventually looked at things like surveillance and the cultural contexts in which this existed in those countries. And that's what those three books are about. I'm happy to share that link if anyone is interested. So I was just managing this project, managing the research. And the way that it worked is that we actually had people testing in those countries to, uh, you know, to, to technically run a test based on a list that had been created by academics to discover which websites were blocked. And I, I'm obviously not going to get into detail here about the different countries, but there was kind of a through line through what we could see. In Europe, of course, you had the blocking of uh, child sexual abuse imagery, which I think most of us would deem as an acceptable use of this tool. Um, but across the world, there was kind of a spectrum um, between you know, semi-democratic countries and authoritarian countries. And what they typically went after were things like um, religions that were not uh, that were that ran counter to the main religion of the country, uh, criticism of the country's human rights record, uh, sexual content, nudity, things like that and at times social media. Now this was about, I think I started working there in 2007, and this was when social media, yeah, uh, or at least web 2.0 was a brand new concept. And so what we saw then were that some countries, um, the ones that I can recall off the top of my head without notes were Turkey and Thailand, uh, were already blocking sites like YouTube, or at least trying to block individual videos. And in these cases, the two that I clearly remember, in Thailand, uh, one of the cases involved a, uh, a video that was critical of the king and specifically had accused him of something uh, possibly false. Um, and in Turkey, it was um, uh, jokes about Ataturk that were inappropriate and illegal under Turkish law. And so both of those governments went after YouTube and blocked it. Um, and as a result, that really changed the way that we, that we researchers there and I think the way that um, governments looked at what was possible in, with respect to social media. Again, this was when it was brand new, um, but it because these platforms didn't want to be blocked in these countries, they actually changed the technical dynamic um, to enable uh, the the governments to request that certain videos be removed or blocked rather than having the governments block block the site entirely. And so that was one thing, one major shift that happened around that time that has um, really shaped the way that governments can interact with these companies. So they can request information be removed or request information about users. And these companies have entire departments to deal with that. So that was my first, my first, um, you know, awareness around this. The second thing came 
for me in about 2010, while I was still in that position, um, a young man, a blogger that I knew from Morocco contacted me and said that he was being censored by Facebook. Now, I wasn't really sure what he meant and thought, how could a company censor someone? It's, it's a company. It's not a government. Um, but what we what we discovered was that his page, which was calling for the separation of religion and state, um, had indeed been, or, sorry, religion and education, had indeed been removed by the platform. Um, and so I wrote about it. And what happened after writing about it was that I ended up starting a relationship with Facebook that continues until this day, um, where we were able to raise these issues with them. And I started to see things a little bit differently, that although social media platforms were companies, in some cases private, in some cases um, you know, uh, uh, public companies um, with shareholders, they nevertheless had an outsized impact on free expression online. And once you start looking at these things, you start seeing it everywhere. I started researching and, and reading and found that there were a lot of complaints along these lines. Now, again, this was 2010. Um, so this was just before the Arab uprisings, which is going to be the next, um, the next element of this talk. Uh, these companies were pretty small. They had really small staff. Um, when people reached out to me from Facebook, they used their real names. I was able to find them, the, the individuals on LinkedIn or find news articles about them. And all of the content moderation, and I'm not even sure we really knew that term at the time, but all of the content moderation was done by humans um, with seemingly little consideration for how it might or might not scale. And at, at the time, most of it was also done in Silicon Valley. So it was a very narrow uh, field. And yet these people had an impact on the entire world. Of course, in the research for my book, I found that these teams were in fact mostly American, largely white. Uh, they were diverse in terms of gender, surprisingly, but nevertheless, these people were making the rules for what the entire world could say. And so that brings me to the Arab uprisings. So just a couple of years prior to the beginning of the Tunisian uprising, we saw the role that these platforms could potentially play in people fighting back against their governments in these movements. Uh, we saw it with Belarus and with Iran in 2009, um, but these were a little bit different, much smaller scale, and a lot of the, the media criticism about them at least, or about how social media played a role, was that it was largely out people outside of the country in the diasporas who were engaging on social media and reporting what was happening. Doesn't make it any less impactful, but it was a much smaller scale, let's say. But by 2010, most people had, in, in, uh, in Tunisia and Egypt, a lot of people at least, had phones in their pockets. Uh, Twitter had enabled SMS to tweet, so you could actually just send an SMS. You didn't have to have uh, a data connection. And a lot of people had home internet. Um, I can't remember the statistics, but they were pretty high numbers at least. But when the Tunisian uprising started, these companies really had no idea the central role that they would play. People in Tunisia had been blogging for a long time. And in fact, I, my recollection is that um, it was one of the countries to, to have the earliest blog network all the way back to the late 90s or early 2000s. But still, um, there was no real anticipation of what would happen next. And so when the Tunisian uprising spread to Egypt and then to other countries, I, from my perspective, because I was in touch with them at the time, um, social media platforms were really taken aback by their own scale. They were surprised mm -hmm. by how, how important of a role that they played. And so in Egypt, um, people took to the streets on January 25th, but there is one little backstory that I just like to share here because I think it, it really does illustrate the issue. In November 2010, over American Thanksgiving weekend, um, I got CC'd on an email thread with some other advocates in the US saying that there was a page in Egypt, a really important page, that had been taken down over that holiday weekend. And that page was actually the one that would eventually call for people to take to the streets on January 25th. It was called We Are All Khaled Said, so named after uh, the young man who was killed by police in Alexandria that summer. Uh, it was Egyptians who were running the page, and the reason that Facebook had removed it was that they'd broken a rule. They were not using their real names for safety reasons, probably obvious safety reasons. Um, and so we scrambled, we advocates scrambled to get Facebook on the line over a holiday weekend. We were actually able to uh, reach some of the highest uh, executives in the company who restored the page under certain conditions, um, and that's shared in my book, but those conditions were basically that someone else stepped forward using their real name to administer the page. So that page fortunately went back up and fortunately enabled people to, um, to uh, call for this up 
something that um, you know was many years in the making, of course, but may not have been coordinated so well without Facebook and without Twitter. And the Egyptian government responded. As people went on the streets on the 25th, they blocked Facebook that day. The next day, they blocked Twitter. You probably all know this story, but the day after that, they blocked the entire internet, with the exception of one ISP. And that one ISP enabled people to continue um, I remember stories of people gathering in one apartment near Tahrir Square to use the internet there. Um, there were mesh networks on the ground. There were people with SMS, of course, who could still call out of the country to get, um, you know, to tell stories and have their friends outside the country report them to media, etc. So not all hope was lost, and the platform still played an important role. They even responded to the internet shutdown. Um, Twitter put in place, or I think they worked with Google to put in place something called speak to tweet that allowed people to call up and uh, leave voice messages that would then become tweets. And so the companies were actually very responsive to what was going on in the ground. And as I'm sure you might remember, the narrative around all of this from media to academia and uh, everywhere, um, governments, even the Obama administration, for instance, the narrative was that these platforms had in fact enabled revolution. And in some ways, that was true. It's hard to say without um, without this style of mass media how well these messages would have spread. Of course, we've always had protest, um, but in an authoritarian country where um, where gatherings are monitored, where uh, protests are banned or restricted, um, it's difficult to organize. And so early on, before these governments were incredibly responsive um, to it, the, the platforms enabled people to at least figure out who each other were. Um, it allowed information cascades to happen. And that's how I see what happened there. And so there was all of this hope after that. Um, but I think in the next few years, things very quickly turned. And I think that's where we're, where we're getting to next. Um, so while the world was seeing these platforms as a means to conduct political advocacy or even topple dictators, authoritarian countries and democratic countries alike were taking notes and figuring out how they needed to engage with platforms and where they needed to step in to control them. And so in those ensuing years, we did see a lot of these platforms blocked. We saw a lot more demands on them to to uh, remove certain content. And as um, SSL encryption, HTTPS, as you know it, became more common um, and more popularized, we saw the ability of uh, governments to, um, to block individual videos or individual pieces of content wane. Um, because it's, uh, I'm not a technologist, so I don't want to get this completely wrong, but it's very difficult to block an individual piece of content over an SSL connection. And so the demands to the companies, the back channels, grew. Um, and then after that, what you had uh, by, I would say by 2014, at least, you had government or you had companies publishing transparency reports, um, sharing for the most part, what governments were demanding, how many pieces of content they were taking down. And this did um, to a large degree give users uh, and, you know, and the public and the media a better sense of what was happening. But it wasn't all, um, it wasn't all good. And we're still struggling with that. I'll come back to that when I talk about the Digital Services Act, though. So 2014, I mentioned, as the point where transparency was becoming popularized. I see 2014 as a turning point for something else. Um, we had all this hope over the prior years. I remember going to lots of conferences, a lot of talk about how these platforms would help. Um, and then around 2014, three things happened um, as I see it. One was there was a lot more pushback around harassment on these platforms and a lot more demand for platforms to do something about the growing sense of harassment that was occurring. A lot of this pushback from what I, where I see it came, seemed to come from the US, but in fact, these were global conversations and there was a lot happening behind the scenes um, organizing to try to figure out how to make this, uh, how to make these platforms safer, uh, particularly for women and other marginalized communities. The second thing was the rise of the Islamic State. Uh, 2014 was the year that James Foley, the journalist from my home state of New Hampshire, um, was beheaded by the Islamic State. And that image spread across all of these platforms and sort of shocked them into doing something about it. Um, in that particular case, his family um, was able, to, I, I, I'm gonna fail to remember the detail here, but his family was able to advocate on the grounds of privacy that the videos and photos should be taken down. But curiously, the platforms actually allowed uh, the, the still images to stay up when they were published by official news media, again, making the decision about who was official and who wasn't and doing that for the entire world. So we started to see this stratification happen over who could publish on these platforms when something was controversial. 
And then the third thing, which is probably obvious, um, is the rise of populism and specifically the rise of the far right uh, and the alt-right in the US as it used to be called, uh, and Trump, of course. Um, and I think that, that those three things all happening at once pushed a lot more, uh, pushed governments to, uh, democratic governments, sorry, to be more uh, responsive to these threats and to put more pressure on the companies. Excuse me. Um, so around 2014, we started to see the Obama administration uh, talking about these companies needing to do something about the rise of terrorism and far-right extremism. We saw more conversations happening in Europe around hate speech um, and the threat of populism. Um, and of course, the conversations around harassment actually did push companies into action. This was around the time that Twitter created um, the Trust and Safety Council, which was recently um, uh, disbanded under the, the new Musk administration, let's say, at Twitter, um, but which for many years brought together a wide range of organizations from all over the world to have more of a say in Twitter's policies and to consult with the company. So it was wasn't all bad, although we're seeing, you know, more, more misinformation and disinformation, more hate speech, more harassment, more terrorism on these platforms. We were also seeing the platforms engaging more with civil society. Um, at conferences that I attended, they were there to listen to people's concerns. Several of them created user groups like Twitter's Trust and Safety Council or consultatory uh, arrangements with different civil society groups, many of which were under um, uh, NDAs, uh, non-disclosure agreements, but nevertheless, which existed and allowed groups from all over the world to have an actual say or consultatory role in policy uh, and in how content moderation worked. But at the same time, as these platforms were growing, content moderation was becoming incredibly increasingly complex for them. Because when you only have a million users, let's say, and that's still a pretty large number, it's not that hard to scale how content moderation works. Um, it's always been, uh, well, until recently, rather, content moderation on the platforms was always a uh, reactive role. So you'd have a user report something that they saw that they believed violated the rules. That would then go in into a backend queue where a content worker, either in Silicon Valley or at a third party company somewhere else in the world, would have to make a binary decision over whether that piece of content should stay up or come down. But as the platform scaled, content moderation had to become more complex. On the one hand, um, they had to scale the number of human moderators that were working. And so that, of course, uh, these companies wanting to save money started hiring third party firms in countries like the Philippines where they could access cheaper labor. Um, but it wouldn't be a few more years until that conversation would become uh, would come to light a bit more about how problematic some of this was. Uh, they also had to institute algorithms or automated technologies that would um, identify certain content and either strike it down or at least identify it for the human moderators. Um, and then there was also a diversification of the actual decision at the end of the process. So whereas it used to be a leave up. Um, or take down uh, binary decision. Um, companies, especially YouTube, I believe pioneered a lot of this, um, made other or created other ways of moderating content. So whether it was demonetization or uh, what we now call shadow banning, what we now know to exist, um, even though companies denied it for many years, uh, shadow banning, of course, being uh, sort of hiding things from search or hiding them from your feed while still allowing them to exist. Um, and so this became much more complex and much more opaque for the rest of the world. And I think that that's when a lot of the conversations in Europe really started in earnest, because um, although, you know, there was obviously a lot of awareness around the world over um, the issues with platforms moderating speech or censoring speech, I think that this is around the time where the conversation kind of shifted into the problematic speech that platforms were hosting and how they weren't responding to it in the ways that they needed to. Um, and so that's when Europe, I think, really started to play a bigger role. And what we've seen in the past few years is uh, a range of different methods of uh, trying to regulate speech. And so I believe that in Europe, I've lived in Europe now for about eight years, um, and I believe that there is a really strong awareness amongst civil society here and amongst some governments, at least, um, of the fact that this is sort of a two-sided problem, that companies do have an outsized role 
old and what can be seen and that they do have the ability to censor even government officials as we've seen in Germany or uh, sorry at least politicians sorry um, but also that there's uh, you know a wide range of problematic um, speech that is uh, enabled by the platforms and um, has obviously created huge problems for democracies. So one of the first attempts I uh, at least from my perspective, uh, is the Network Enforcement Act in Germany, which um, holds companies liable for the speech that they that they host for hate, for, sorry, for illegal, mostly hate speech that they host. Um, this is one method that's become really popular throughout the world, and in some cases, in a democracy like Germany, can be fairly effective. Um, it it's you know it was criticized widely, including by me when it first came out, but it hasn't created the problems that we expected it to. In fact, though, I would say that it's 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 been mildly useful. Um, it, the issue with it, of course, is that it it still puts the the onus on the companies to to uh, to know and determine what is hate speech under a given law. Um, there's also been issues with the reporting. So when you use Twitter in Germany, for example, you can only report hate speech in the German language, oh, um, which obviously in a country that has welcomed so many migrants over the past few years has made things actually quite difficult for many of them uh, who are targets of hate speech. Um, but another issue around it is that. Uh, the 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 penalty is on the company rather than on the person engaging in hate speech. And so prior to this law, um, of course, the government had to do, or uh, the judiciary rather, had to do a lot more work to go after individuals, but the individual would be penalized. And there's plenty of research that shows um, that individuals are more likely to be deterred if they're actually held liable or responsible for engaging in hate speech. Um, when the company is the target, they pay a fine and that's really it. Um, of course, I, I see this law as also being problematic in the sense that it's been replicated in a bunch of countries that are less democratic than Germany um, and abused by governments to go after things that are not hate speech, but rather things that they deem illegal, um, but are, protect, are, are otherwise protected speech. The Digital Services Act, though, is a really different approach, um, and I think that there's a lot of good in it. There's some negatives as well, but I'll mostly focus on the good. Um, so in one way, it... Uh, uh, it creates a fast track procedure for law enforcement to take on the role of trusted flaggers um, so they can they can they're basically given a, a fast track to be able to report things that are illegal. Um, and so, you know, again, in democracy, this is a, a good thing. It also preserves the EU system of limited liability for online intermediaries, which means that the platforms, unlike with the Network Enforcement Act, platforms can't be held responsible for user content as long as they remove content that they actually know to be illegal. So as long as they remove it when they're alerted to it, um, they're not responsible for proactively removing content. And EFF sees this as a good thing. And I think so do most of civil society that we work with in Europe. What, um, one other thing that the DSA does, though, that I'm really happy about is it has a strong emphasis on greater transparency and user rights. So it has requirements on platforms to explain their content curation algorithms um, in more detail in user friendly language and in all of the EU languages, which is fantastic. I'd love to see that, of course, expanded to more languages. But for now, great start. Um, it also, you know, it aims to ensure that you users can better understand content decisions, which are often seen as arbitrary, um, and how they can pursue a, a path of recourse, reinstatement, so appeals. Um, and this is something that we've been focused on with, a, with a, a large group of civil society organizations from all over the world for a few years now uh, in the Santa Clara Principles for Transparency and Accountability and Content Moderation, which um, I think eight groups and individuals first created, and then we did another consultatory process with, I think, more than 50 organizations in 11 or so countries, um, and which we put out a, a new version of last year, and you can see those at santaclaraprinciples.org. And I bring those up because we did bring those to um, the, the minds behind the DSA and uh, believe that they were um, taken into account in, in creating these uh, transparency measures. Um, there's a lot more there, of course. I, I feel like explaining the DSA is probably not the best use of my time right now. Um, and it's also quite a complex uh, set of a piece of legislation, but I do see it as the right approach. Um, looking at, you know, going, uh, sorry, I just want to check my time before I talk too much more. How am I on time? You're doing okay. Yeah. Great. Excellent. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so going after um, harmful illegal speech while also um, having limited liability for platforms when they do their job um, and giving users more rights in the process. And I think that this is a great model for how we can look at this globally. Um, of course, you know, the negative side of the DSA is that it is just for Europe and a lot of the, the people who are 
uh, most impacted by bad content moderation decisions, whether again, a failure to take something down or a failure to keep it up, um, are in other parts of the world where far less attention is given by these companies. Um, and we see this disparity all the time, even just in the, the recent, um, um, what's the word, uh, insurrection, thank you, um, in, uh, in Brazil, Mm. There was a lot more attention paid to the same thing when it happened in the US, um, but in Brazil, uh, from what I've heard from my colleagues there, the companies have not given a lot of um, uh, a lot of resources to to people there who are very concerned about how platforms were utilized in organizing that. Um, so that brings me to the, the three topics that I'm kind of thinking about at the moment. There's a lot more but I tried to narrow it down um, as three kind of examples of issues that are ongoing right now that I think that companies uh, need to be more responsive to or are starting to be responsive to, at least in one case. So one is the issue of conflict zones and uh, extremism or terrorism. So the, the Christchurch um, massacre a few years ago uh, resulted in the creation of something called the Christchurch Call, uh, which works with the platforms very closely to ensure that they are being responsive to, to terrorist content on, the, on their sites. This is by and large a good thing, but one of the issues here uh, that has been raised by a lot of civil society groups, in which I've worked on a bit, is that um, the use of automation in this practice and the scale at which it's occurring makes it very difficult to determine what is in fact a piece of uh, terrorist propaganda versus what is a journalist or a user documenting a war crime, uh, to put a really fine point on it. And these, these videos, these images, the text um, have actually been used in war crimes tribunals. There is an example of a few years ago where a YouTube video was utilized in a case where a Libyan general was prosecuted in The Hague. And I use this example um, because I think that without, if, if the companies were doing a better job of preserving this content, at least on their back end, I think we would see a lot more of these cases where this type of content is used to, uh, to aid in prosecutions. But what the companies are actually doing in many cases is disappearing the content. They're not simply you know, penalizing it. Um, they're taking it down and essentially throwing it in the trash. Uh, and this creates an untenable situation for human rights workers who rely on these platforms, sometimes in low bandwidth situations, to quickly get content out, sometimes even in a live stream format. So I think that that's one really uh, strong example of a pertinent issue, an ongoing issue, um, where companies are, in many ways, under pressure by governments and therefore um, failing to you know, to 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 pay uh, significant enough heed to the real concerns of people working in conflict zones. One example, um, another very, very different example, but I think it's actually an interesting one because it does have one of the, the same back end issues. And I'll explain that in just a second. Um, adult nudity or nudity by and large pornography, all of it really sexual content. This is an interesting example because um, child sexual abuse imagery has long been dealt with by using automation. It was one of the first uh, content categories to have a primarily automated response. Um, and this was through a tool called photo DNA that uh, allows companies to run, uh, I'm going to explain this in very non-technical terms, um, but basically allows companies to have uh, something running on the back end that when a child sexual abuse image comes up on their platform, it can be matched to an image that's put into a database by law enforcement and then automate automatically taken down. This means that um, the content workers don't have to see the image. Sometimes these images are, of course, heinous and uh, traumatizing. So that's a very good thing. Um, and it also means that anything that's put into the database by law enforcement can then you know, be rapidly taken down. Obviously, this doesn't cover everything, but it's a good tool. This tool was actually uh, modified to be used for extremist content. So these are two linked issues. Now, that's just child sexual abuse imagery, but of course we have the issue of uh, consenting adults wanting to share things, whether we're talking about sexual content or things like breastfeeding images or um, photos of uh, gender affirming surgery or mastectomies for breast cancer, et cetera, et cetera. And the platforms, because of the fact that they have to be responsive to illegal pornography, child sexual abuse Im imagery, and a very wide audience um, from all over the world with different cultural values, typically have banned most nudity from their platforms because it's easier, this is my perspective at least, because it's easier to take it all down than have to decide what is consensual, what is adult, et cetera. Now, don't get me wrong, these are very hard problems. 
problems. Um, AI can't easily detect between a 17 year old and 18 year old to use a, a blunt example. Um, but at the same time, I think that it does restrict freedom of expression. Um, uh, whether we're talking about art or political protest or just someone wanting to share their body. Um, and so the Facebook over the meta, excuse me, the meta oversight board, um, which is the separate body created by Meta or Facebook a few years ago uh, to aid with these content decisions and has a board from all over the world with different backgrounds, including lawyers, technologists, et cetera. They recently overturned um, Meta's original decisions, so their content moderation decisions in uh, cases involving gender identity and nudity. So this is very specifically related to the issue of people or transgender or non-binary um, being treated as, as women or as female um, in these decisions uh, because of the fact that they have a certain body part. Um, and so basically what the oversight board has said is that it's um, unjust to, to treat them, uh, you know, to, to basically misgender them uh, in these cases and identify them as women. Um, and so this is sort of, you know, Meta is now in enabling a change in their policy because of this. And basically, um, you know, it, it's, I think they're tackling a really difficult issue um, and one that, you know, it's, it's in due time for them to have, have taken this on. I'm happy to answer more questions about it. Um, I'm just aware of the time. So um, I'll jump to my last thought and then kind of give a couple closing remarks. Uh, decentralization is the other topic that I'm thinking of a lot, and I won't get into this one as much because it's still a very new topic and one where I think I'm, I'm still mulling a lot of this over in my head about how it works. But the um, we've had a, a decentralized platforms, or at least I've known about them since, uh, or social, sorry, decentralized social media platforms since around 2011 when a tool called Diaspora uh, came out for a bit. It never really got popular, but the conversation started for me then, and that conversation being one of um, what if we all ran our own servers and what if we were the ones who decided what was allowed on social media platforms instead of, you know, these major companies and their shareholders. Um, and these sites existed for this whole time, sites like Mastodon. Um, and for those who aren't really familiar with them, I can and say that basically the way that this works is kind of like email. Um, with email, you might have your employer's email, you might, not your friend might have Gmail, another person might have, I don't know, Yahoo, um, I hope not, but maybe they still have it. Um, and you can all interact mm -hmm. with each other, even though your email's on different servers. Mastodon's really similar to that in that I can have a server, you can have one, maybe your employer has one, and yet they're all interoperable. They can all interact across the different servers, and you can each have your own set of rules, um, just like email providers each have their own set of rules when it comes to spam. Uh, so Elon Musk buying Twitter kind of created a really rapid rise in Mastodon's popularity. And I, I don't know the user growth stats, but they're pretty incredible. Um, and now people are kind of seeing these things as real possibilities. But from my perspective, I think that they also raise new questions about what content moderation can and should look like. Mm -hmm. Because just as it's problematic for Mark Zuckerberg to make the rules about what I can say on his platform, I'm also not thrilled necessarily um, with the ideals or ideologies of some of the people who run these servers. And we've actually seen, um, I've had lots of conversations with people that I work with, especially in the US, especially black communities in the US, who feel that they're being kind of tone policed, told not to talk about racism and things like that um, by people who just want their servers to be happy and friendly. Um, and so that's just one, you know, one example that I'm seeing, but you could see how this could create other issues, including for some of the issues that I talked about, such as, you know, not wanting people sharing things coming out of uh, conflict zones like Syria. So I think that that kind of brings me to the conclusion and really the big question at stake um, with respect to hate speech, but with, all, with respect to really all of these uh, issues, which is who should decide? Um, and obviously this is a question that we've been dealing with since the beginning of time, or at least the beginning of thought around freedom of expression. Um, but I think that you know there's something else at stake when it's private companies that make this decision, these decisions, um, because these companies, have you know their their primary motivator is uh, money and their primary currency is your data and so they're that's what they're operating under um, and when they're making content rules or content decisions they're not doing it with freedom of expression or their users best interests in mind they're doing it while trying to raise their profits and also please everyone else and so in some ways decentralized platforms could do a better job of this but will they do a better job at regulating hate speech? Um, I, you know, I think that it's possible that a lot of servers could be conscientious about this, but at the same time, how could they scale? Mm. 
well, how can they respond? Well, how can they know all of the laws for one thing? And German law and hate speech is pretty complex. I've tried to look at it. Um, but then, you know, Germany is just one country. How could they know all of the world's laws and how can they make these decisions? And so I don't want to say that this is an intractable problem, but rather I think it's one where we need all hands on deck. Um, and that's not what we have right now. Right now we've got, and again, I, I, I say this not insulting Europe, but I do see Europe making decisions for Europeans um, while having an outsized impact now on platforms and on the entire world. And so I think it's really vital that we're also bringing people to into the discussion from other parts of the world who, again, often have more at stake. Um, the, stake the, the stakes are a lot higher when you're living in, uh, in a cultural context where the threat of violence every day is real. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of close with just a thought that I, I heard in a, a podcast yesterday, um, but from someone I know personally. And this podcast was talking about the Facebook Oversight Board and how some of the, the test runs around its creation were made. I was actually at one of these. Um, there were seven uh, different sessions that they did before the Oversight Board was, was formalized. And in these sessions, they had people like me, lawyers, technologists, um, given examples where we had to make a decision about a piece of content based on what we thought was right. And one of those uh, examples, and this was talked about in the podcast, so I don't have to worry about non-disclosure agreements, um, was uh, the phrase, kill all men. And Mark Zuckerberg talks about it and he says, well, yeah, you know, we did, we did censor this, but eventually we, we we came to the understanding from you know these cons these consultations with people in the U.S. and in Europe that kill all men was usually used um, as a you know a, just an expression of frustration and a form of punching up because men of course you know being dominant throughout the world. But there's a woman that I know, uh, Barhan Taib from Ethiopia, who spoke in that in that podcast and said, well, that you know in her context coming from Ethiopia, Ethiopia, she doesn't really agree with that. And the reason is that the punching up, punching down dynamic, although she understands it, of course, and agrees with it in theory, that in a conflict zone, or a politically hot zone, even, um, that the dynamics of what is punching up and what what is punching down shift rapidly. When you mm -hmm. have two groups that are in conflict with each other, one might be in power one day, one might be in power the next day. And for me that, you know, I've obviously I've thought of this before in some way, but her comment really stuck with me. Um, because I think that that is the problem with enabling authorities uh, to make these decisions without the, con uh, without the, the input of global constituents. Um, we live in a globalized world. And while we don't have a form of global democracy that works for everyone, I think that this is is a point in time where we have to consider speech decisions and policies around speech um, as something that that needs to be somewhat universalized. So I will close there because I think we've got plenty of time for uh, for comments and questions. Thank you.